Good afternoon. I'm Lark Mason. And on behalf of Asia Week New York, my colleagues in the United States and our speakers who are scattered across the globe, we welcome you to our presentation today, which is Kondo Takahiro, The Thinking Hand. Asia Week New York is an international organization with a yearly ground gathering each year in New York City, occurring this year between March 14 and 22nd. Leading dealers, academics, and auction houses converge in New York to see masterworks of Asian art, experience events at many of New York's greatest cultural institutions, and go and enjoy the sights and sounds and food of this dynamic metropolis. To learn more about Asia Week New York, go to the Asia Week website and when there, be sure to register to keep abreast of our events that take place in person and online throughout the year. During this presentation, you can submit questions online by using the Q&A button on the bottom of your computer screen or cell phone, and these will be presented to our speakers by our moderator today, Joe Earle. Again, on behalf of my colleagues at Asia Week, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you online and during Asia Week in New York this March. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Lark, and good evening, everybody. Now, for those of you who don't know, the subject of our... Stop my video. For those of you who don't know, the subject of our webinar today, Kondo Takahiro, was born into a recent ceramic lineage based in Kyoto. His grandfather, Yuzo, enrolled at ceramic school, aged just 10, and in 1921, he became assistant to Tomimoto Kenkichi, the leading ceramic innovator of his era. The lively, informal style of these pots by three generations, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, reflects the influence of Tommy Moto, who had visited Korea and admired the dynamic decoration of their recent porcelain. Yuzo's own masterly vessels would eventually earn him the accolade of living national treasure. He passed on his style to his second son. The jar by his grandson, Takehiro, seen on the left here, shows us how fully he too had absorbed the family style following a brief career as a championship table tennis player. In 1990, Takahiro was selected to represent the family with an exhibition in Sao Paulo, where local Japanese artists alerted him to the limitations of his practice, which at that time was confined to scenes from nature applied to the surfaces of porcelain vessels. Next slide, please. On his return to Kyoto, he mostly abandoned wheel thrown forms in favor of rectilinear shapes, better suited to the abstract style of motive, motif making seen here using the familial, familiar medium of cobalt blue to express an inner world reflecting elements of Western abstraction. Next, please. By 1999, he was already exploring a new idea, water born of fire. Next, please. That has been key to much of his subsequent practice. In the late 1990s, he made increasing use of this ginteki sai, silver mist, an invention of his own formed from silver and frit, a mixture of silica and fluxes to which he later added other metals, mixed together to form a kind of paint that is brushed on the surface. During kiln firing, the droplets of paint solidify, in the artist's words, taking on an appearance that more, looks almost more like water than real water. Next, please. In 2002, Takahiro was granted a traineeship in Edinburgh, where he mastered the skills of glass casting, seen here on the lid of this piece. He was inspired also by a trip to the Orkney Islands where he saw the Ring of Brodga, an ancient circle of huge rocks connecting heaven and earth, life and death, past and future, to use his words. In 2003, he also visited London where British artist Grayson Perry was awarded the Turner Prize. The shock of learning that someone whose practice included pots like Perry could enjoy such a level of global esteem prompted Takahiro to think about his future direction. Back in Japan, he affirmed to an interviewer that the important thing is for Japanese ceramics 
to escape from a sense of national self-sufficiency and achieve recognition on the international stage. Next, please. Inspired by those massive broadcast stones, Takahiro began to construct large-scale works, five or seven feet high, assembled from piled blocks of porcelain, often separate, separated by blocks of cast, cast glass. These monoliths, as he calls them, combining hard-won manual and material skills, both Eastern and Western, pushed the boundaries between conventional Japanese ceramics and the potential of clay as a medium for contemporary art. Next, please. In 2008, he began to make self-portraits, taking molds of his own head and casting them in porcelain applied with a variety of glazes. Next, please. The spiritual nature of the manner in which a few of these heads had come into being at outdoor firings like this one, conceived as a celebration of man and nature in creative harmony, took on additional meaning on March the 11th, 2011, when the Great East Japan earthquake and flood struck, followed by the Fukushima National Power, Nuclear Power Plant explosion, making the artist's theme of death and re rebirth seem like a prophetic reflection of a troubled era, even though he had conceived those heads before the disaster happened. Next, please. The most consequential of Takahiro's projects in the years after 2011 has been Reduction, a series of 21 seated figures cast from his own body in a traditional Asian med meditative pose. To quote Robert Mintz, with the artist placing himself at the center of the tragedy as a memorial marker pointing to a moment of transition. In the case of the Reduction figure on the left here, the swirling clay surface evokes the appearance of the tsunami Next, please, as it swept over the coast, carrying everything in its path, a theme to which he has referred often in smaller vessel forms. Takahiro continues to address pressing contemporary themes, but he's recently been exploring anew the significance of vessel form and the nature of ceramic art. In the same way that the Fukushima disaster had reminded the world of the fallibility of technology when confronted by overwhelming natural forces, Takahiro has come to realize afresh that ceramic art is an endeavor requiring recognition of natural factors beyond human comprehension. Next, please. Now here is a perfectly formed vase thrown by uh, his father nearly 80 years ago. Perhaps in reaction to his family's background in the creation of pure white vessels, in recent years, Takahiro has, com has completed around 100 hakuji otsubo, large white porcelain vessels. Next, please. Outsized pots, bigger than anything he has previously made on a wheel. Starting with upwards of 150 pounds of porcelain clay, he experiences the creative process as a kind of live performance, almost as a game of table tennis, in which subject and object, man and clay, constantly switch off until, as he puts it, it's impossible to tell who's leading and who's following. At times split open, as here, so that they're no longer literal containers, but abstract forms that interrogation the relationship interrogate the relationship between a vessel and its inner and outer spaces, these latest creations make me very optimistic about the, cap the capacity of the Kondo family tradition and its lineage to transcend boundaries and keep surprising it all, keep surprising us all. Now I'd like to invite my former colleague at the MFA Boston, now, at Bos in, now in Boston, uh, Joan Cummins, to talk about the exhibition of Kondo's work that she's putting on there. Thank you, Joe. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Joan Cummins, Curator of Asian Art at the Brooklyn Museum, and I'm delighted to introduce my museum's current installation of glorious objects by Kondo Takahiro, shown together with works by his family members. It will be on view until early December, and I'm hoping that this introduction will entice some of you to come and see it in Brooklyn or at one of the future venues. The show draws almost entirely from the collection of Carol and Jeffrey Horvitz, who acquired many of the objects with an exhibition in mind. It was curated by Joe Earle, who you now know well, um, who wrote a great catalog visible in the distance behind me. Um, and a number of the pieces that Joe just showed are in the exhibition. Could I have the next slide, please? 
The show is installed in Brooklyn's relatively new Gallery for the Arts of Japan, which is named in memory of the museum's beloved board member, uh, Leslie Beller. Leslie was an avid collector of Japanese contemporary clay, and three objects in the show are loans from Leslie's husband, Alan. We designed the Japan Gallery to be relatively flexible. This was our first stab at repurposing it. So half of the gallery remains dedicated to historic material and the other half behind the Ainu robe that you see here is now home to the Kondo family show. Next slide, please. Here are some views of the installation. Uh, Kondo Takahiro's uh, evocative self-portrait titled Reduction sits at the center. You've heard a little from Joe about the Reduction series and we're going to hear more about it shortly. So while it is a favorite of our visitors, I am going to focus on other aspects of the exhibition. Can I have the next slide, please? Most of the objects, <coughs> excuse me, in the show are by Takahiro, including this cluster of monoliths dating, uh, ranging in date from 2007 to 2021. We chose to install them in something like a circle to invoke the Ring of Brogdar, which uh, as you heard is a Neolithic site uh, located on the Orkney Islands that inspired this form. What you cannot see in this photo is that all of the monoliths are covered in the silver mist glaze that has been Takahiro's most celebrated innovation. Can I have the next slide, please? This trio of large cone-shaped vessels has really wowed our visitors. It's a terrible photo that really doesn't do justice to the objects, but here you can see some of the effect of the silver mist. I've coined a new term, misting out, that describes the state of awe and reverie that people experience when first encountering these and other great examples of Takahiro's work. Can I have the next slide, please? As I mentioned, the show also includes work by Takahiro's grandfather, Kondo Yuzo, his father, Kondo Hiroshi, and his uncle, Kondo Yutaka. Their pieces appear along with smaller examples by Takahiro in the back part of the gallery where we have four long cases. Figuring out how to include the other generations was a little tricky. Takahiro himself is leery of making too much of the idea of an artistic legacy, insisting that the main thing he inherited was a desire to find an individual voice. It seemed a little dull to keep give each artist his own case, so instead I arranged the objects by color. This made for a visually attractive display, but it also allowed the generations to mingle, and it highlights just how innovative Takahiro's work really is. This part of the installation is virtually impossible to photograph because the cases are relatively close together but it is very effective in person and the juxtapositions are instructive. On the left here, you see our case dedicated to white facing the case dedicated to blue. Can I have the next slide, please? What we find with this approach is that there are certain common threads that join the generations and most notably uh, the use of porcelain and blue cobalt decoration. The white case allows us to address the important role played by the mentor of the Kondo artists, Tomimoto Kenkichi. Among other things, Tomimoto reinterpreted the previously stayed medium of porcelain, presenting its potential for experimentation and self-expression. On the left, we see a very nice Tomimoto lidded jar that my museum collected quite early, very clever of us, um, thanks to Tomimoto's influence, all Kondo artists learned to throw porcelain jars on a wheel, as seen below. This led to radical work like Takahiro's giant white vessels, which he, as we heard, wrestles into shape, only to have the clay tell him what it really wants to do. By the next slide, please. The white case ends with two gorgeous Takahiro works from his early experimentation with cast glass. 
Takehiro has long been interested in the ways that he can create the effect of water from fire. With the introduction of cast glass, especially in these all white pieces, he creates ice from fire. Can I have the next slide, please? The blue case then offers an opportunity to look at the use of cobalt to decorate porcelain, as seen in these three jars and others in the show, uh, representing groundbreaking decoration by Yuzo, uh, the pomegranates, uh, particularly nice pieces by Hiroshi with the sort of sea grapes, um, and an early willow jar by Takehiro below. In the show, we talk about how Yuzo brought new life to a medium that had become pretty codified. And then we see Takahiro take the palette and the sculpture of the vessel into very new directions in this early slab built vessel on the right that Joe already talked about. Can I have the next slide, please? The blue case concludes in marvelous rectilinear pieces covered in silver mist including one small piece by Takahiro that is in the Brooklyn collection. We think this was actually the first piece of Takahiro's to enter the, a permanent collection of an American museum. Can I have the next slide, please? In the two vertical pieces, both from the Galaxy 01 series, we see that even though he was working within certain parameters, the results could be very different. This close-up shows incised and carved surfaces and the diverse ways that the mist droplets would adhere to those surfaces. Can I have the next slide, please? The next case is my favorite uh, because it allows me to bring in some of the outliers in the show in a really harmonious arrangement. This is the black case. And in the foreground, we can see a selection of the ash glazed vessels that Takahiro has made at his wood fired kiln in Tohoku. These offer a reminder that even though he's best known for the silver mist glaze, Takahiro has actually worked in a very wide range of media and forms and is constantly trying something new. Could I have the next slide, please? The black themed case also allowed me to bring in the work of Takahiro's uncle, Kondo Yutaka, who worked in stoneware and drew inspiration from all over the world. I adore Yutaka's work, but figuring out how to incorporate it into the show was difficult um, because he so completely bucked the idea of a family style. In putting him together with black and blackened objects by Takahiro, I started to see affinities between the two. Can I have the next slide, please? Any similarities may well be coincidental, and Takahiro would tell you that the main thing he inherited from his uncle was a desire to innovate. But I do feel just a little of Yutaka's swirling and dripping forms in Takahiro's nariage, or marbled pieces. Takahiro made the marbled pieces as, as a direct response to the horrifying tsunami of March 11th, 2011, um, with the, the churning effect created by kneading the two colors of clay, evoking the chaos of inundation. Can I have the next slide? Finally, we have everyone else's favorite case, uh, dedicated to red, green, and gold. There are points to be made throughout this case about materiality, but mostly the juxtapositions celebrate the jewel-like beauty of the objects. Can I have the next slide, please? There are some super rare pieces in here because Takahiro has not worked in red very often, and while his father and grandfather occasionally added overglaze red or gold enamel to their mostly blue and white vessels, those two are more the exception than the rule. And this all red jar is extremely unusual. Can I have the last slide, please? I am out of time, so I will leave you here with this gorgeous tea bowl which is just a reminder that leaning in to one of Takahiro's pieces, no matter how small, is always a good idea. Please come see these pieces in person and thank you. Now I'm turning us over to Xiaojing Wu, who will tell us about an evocative piece in the Seattle Art Museum. Thanks.
Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Asia Week, for organizing this webinar about Kundo Takahilo's work. I'm Xiao Jin Wu. Currently, I'm the Luther W. Brady Curator of Japanese Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But today, I will zero in on one important acquisition made when I worked at the Seattle Art Museum, Kundo Takahilo's reduction. Through a close look at this one singular work, I hope to unpack the multiple layers of meaning created by Takahilo's thinking hand. Next slide, please. I was on the lookout for Takahilo's work for quite some time. And finally, in 2019, we acquired one of the 21 ceramic statues from the reduction series. As you've already heard from Joe, this series was created in response to the aftermath of the triple disaster that occurred on March 11th, 2011 in the Tohoku region. Modeled after the artist on body, the figure is seated in a meditation pose, contemplating the dire consequences of certain human activities, such as using nuclear power. Next slide. Each of the 21 sculptures varies greatly in its glaze, and therefore each should be considered a unique work. On my visit to Takahilo's studio, which was also where his grandfather, Kondo Yuto, worked, I learned firsthand Takahilo's philosophical thinking on ceramic art and his endeavor to draw from the ceramic tradition exemplified by his grandfather, and at the same time to find a place for his own work in the often idea-driven contemporary art world. Next slide. After the studio visit, it was not hard to pick the work that we believe would work the best for the museum collection and display. As this image shows, the piece nicely connects with the grandfather's renowned blue and white wear in its use of cobalt blue glaze. And at the same time, it departs from the tradition of the previous generations rather drastically. Next slide. On this piece, Takahilo's signature silver mist glaze works beautifully in concert with the dripping blue glaze, creating layered patina-like texture. The silver mist glaze is such an ingenious invention that can be better to represent water on a ceramic work. Next slide. This acquisition coincided with the transformation of the Seattle Asia Art Museum, one of the three sites of the Seattle Art Museum. This 1933 Art Deco building is situated in an Olmsted design park, a beautiful setting surrounded by nature, and in a city on the Pacific Rim with strong ties to Japan. After a two-year major renovation, the museum reopened in early 2020 with its 15 galleries completely reinstalled. Next slide. In the next couple of minutes, I will walk you through our working process as we decide where to best place this work at the Seattle Asia Art Museum. And I hope the process can help us better understand the richness of this work. Next slide. When we consider reduction's place in ceramic art history, the first gallery that came to mind was this color in clay gallery where ceramic work from across Asia are arranged by color of their glaze from white to black to celadon to blue and white and to polychrome. The natural light coming from the windows changes the colors and looks of all the works on display here. Reduction could be placed at the end of this long row as a contemporary example. But unlike the functional vessels here, Reduction goes beyond utilitarian functions. Next slide, please. On my studio visit, I also saw Takahilo's work in progress, the White Moon Jar series. He intentionally broke some of the jars 
challenging the fundamental concept of utua or vessel. For him, ceramic art is about creating space that is shaped by vessel. So in that sense, regardless of its function, a ceramic work is a vessel that contains a unique space within and beyond. Next slide. The body language, in particular the cross-legged pose and meditation gesture, makes this work a good fit in two other galleries. Next slide. This gallery, titled Awakened Ones, features a 12th century Amida Buddha in a meditation pose. Reduction could be a fine company to the Amida. The two statues could face each other, both contemplating, perhaps on human sufferings. In fact, some first time viewers mistook a reduction as a sculpture of Buddha because of its similar pose with that of the Amida, a sculpture well known to art museum regulars in Seattle. Next slide. Or in this Divine Bodies Gallery, reduction could be juxtaposed with the religious sculptures to highlight its hand gesture. Next slide. But ultimately, we decided to place reduction on the top of the fountain in the garden court, a central space that connects to the natural world outside through the glass doors, and also a focal point when a visitor steps into the museum door. Next slide, please. It is also the only place inside the museum where water flows. The dripping water from the fountain resonates perfectly with the dripping droplets of the silver mist glaze. For Takahilo, ceramic art, or earthworks as he puts it, is a unity of fire, earth, and water. So this spot seems befitting for provoking that key idea of ceramic art. Next slide. The look of the space changes by the day, by the time of the day and the day of the year. So does reduction. This constantly changing environment evokes a sense of transcendence for which reduction service serves a timeless reminder. Next slide. From where reduction sits, it looks out to the park through the beautiful Art Deco facade. Next slide. At the other end of its gaze is the Black Sun by Isamu Noguchi and Seattle's cloudy sky. Next slide. Back inside the garden court, Reduction sits on top of the fountain and invites conversations about ceramic art, about environment, and reminds us the fragile relationship we have with nature. With that, I'm heading it over to Glenn Adamson to put Takahilo's work in the global context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shajin, and it's a pleasure to be with you all. Thanks very much to Asia Week uh, for hosting this great event. I'm going to pick up right where Shajin left off, if you could go to the next slide, uh, with this great work reduction. And I want to uh, add a note of appreciation here to the images that Shajin just showed us that were, as it were, from the sculpture's own perspective, gazing out through the windows of the museum off to the Noguchi, which puts you in the subject position of the work itself. Um, the, the work that we're um, looking at now is in the collection of the Minneapolis Art Institute, as you can see. And it's typical of the series, um, as you've already heard, uh, it features not only this idea of reduction, which is literally uh, a re reducing of the scale of the work because of the, uh, the uh, evaporation of water in the kiln, uh, but also a kind of suggestion of spiritual reduction, of spiritual minimalization, a disappearance of the flesh, a transformation, uh, gradual though it may be, into the realm of pure spirit. And of course, this example, like many of them, features this Ginteki silver mist glaze. Now, I want to start with something that Kondo Sensei said in 2000, the year 2000. He said that it's largely thanks to silver mist that I could extend my practice to include pieces that were more sculptural in character. 
which really caught my eye when I read it because it seems at first counterintuitive that a surface treatment, which we might even think of as a decorative treatment, could hold the key to what ultimately has become his sculptural practice. But as I want to try to argue with uh, for you in these brief remarks, there's something about the emphasis on the surface and particularly the quality of mediation that the Ginteki glaze brings to the work that I think has had a profound effect not only his, on his sculpture, but also on his connection to the uh, broader context of contemporary art in which he has practiced. And here I would just remind you that Kondo Sensei is a very cosmopolitan figure who's been not only in the UK, but also has had a practice that's really worldwide. So although we would often think of him partly because of his familial connections as very firmly rooted in the tradition of Japanese ceramics, I think we must also understand him as a practitioner of late 20th century and now 21st century contemporary art. So what I want to do is to try to unfold this work, which I hope you will hold in your eye. I know, you know you've now seen several versions of it already in the preceding talks. And I'm going to suggest some various comparisons that might help us to unfold its meanings. So if we could go to the next slide, I'll begin with what is perhaps the most obvious and maybe funniest comparison that could be made, which is to Namjoon Pike's TV Buddha. Uh, as you already have heard, one obvious reading of reduction is that it is Kondo's response to the traditional form of the Buddhist meditative figure, seated figure. And here is Namjoon Pike doing the same thing, um, you know, decades earlier, creating this closed loop of self-reference by virtue of positioning a sculpture in front of a camera, watching its own uh, projection on a screen. Uh, all the funnier because of the television that Pike has chosen here, um, which has this kind of sci-fi or space age quality. So also a suggestion here of the future meeting the past, which I think is another dimension um, that we could attribute to Kondo's work. But what I'm particularly thinking here is that when you look at this work in relation to Kondo's, it occurs to you that the kind of mediation that he is engaged with in reduction is more than just physical. So when I say mediation here, I mean the transformation through a material um, event, the firing and the glazing that uh, as it were, creates a kind of virtuality around the form so that it becomes a representation of a body rather than a real body, a representation of the self rather than the actual self. But again, seems to suggest that subject position that Xiaojin showed us so effectively. Well, here we have a mediation that's more literal or at any rate, more technological we might think about the relationship between the physical transformation that happens in Kondo ceramic work and the technical transformation that happens in the TV Buddha to somewhat similar, <clears throat> somewhat similar effect, perhaps quite different emotional effect. As, as I said, this one quite comic, Kondo is quite serious, but still um, very much having to do with a reflection on selfhood um, in and of itself. If you go to the next slide, um, we might uh, then think about other tendencies that were originating back in the 1960s and 70s that have informed Kondo's work. And here I'm particularly thinking about the trajectory of pop art, which of course we might associate with Andy Warhol, the Diamond Dust series that he made in the 1980s, uh, being a particularly, again, evident um, or obvious comparison to make to Kondo's work. Uh, this of course not made with actual diamond dust, but with crushed glass, but still a sense of a kind of glittering surface that announces its own artificiality or unreality very much in the way that the Ginteki glaze does, although in a much more blunt and kind of kitschy uh, fashion. Or next slide, uh, we could think about this iconic 21st century artwork, Damien Hirst for the Love of God, which consists of 8,601 diamonds set into a platinum uh, skull uh, with real teeth. Um, and there's much that can be said about this work and much has been said about it, not least by Hearst himself, although perhaps the most um, authentic thing said about it was what inspired the title. Supposedly, Hearst's own mother said, um, what will you do next for the love of God? And that was what inspired Hearst to give uh, the sculpture its name. But here you see a kind of post-pop artist, again, really focusing attention on the surface, on, on the question of value here, literalizing the question of value very much. And again, engaging in an act of extreme transformation that brings the work into dialogue with the self. One could, one could perhaps call it a self-portrait of a very allegorical kind, but if so, it's one that expands the concept of self-portraiture into a reflection on um, you know, the uh, ephemerality of the human 
uh, lifespan on the long tradition of funerary artwork, uh, both European and in this case, Mesoamerican. Um, and in general, the idea that art can aspire to a kind of cosmic expression of the finitude of life, while at the same time having an ironic and in some ways knowing uh, relationship to its own act of meaning making. And I, I think when we put Hearst's work next to Kondo's, what we can see is that Kondo is operating in that same space of representation of mediation, even the very idea of making an artwork that is intentionally uh, staging itself for photographic reproduction, because after all, many people, many more people have seen this work in image form as we're looking at it here rather than in person, and is, is sort of absorbing that, qu that quality of mediation into itself. Now, I think what Kondo is doing in reduction is instead of emphasizing that quality of mediation is in some way providing some friction or some resistance to it. And in that regard, if you go to the next slide, it reminds me um, in a surprising way, you know, of an object or an artwork that's much less visually resonant with reduction, but in some ways spiritually or emotionally is perhaps more comparable would be Mark Quinn's self or rather his series of works, which are called self. If you go to the next slide, you'll see another one of these. Um, each of them consists of 10 pints of blood that are frozen, um, oh, sorry, cast in, in the shape of the, um, if you just go to the next slide, please, thank you, um, that are cast in the shape of the artist's head and frozen so that they uh, stay perpetually um, in, that, in that shape. Can we go to the next slide? Would that be okay? Thank you. And if you just go to the next one as well, and then one more. So you see here how how Quinn is doing the same exercise every five years in this kind of series of um, frozen representations of himself with approximately the amount of blood that would be in a human body. So again, a very powerful statement of um, the self as a physical entity that has its own, um, as I said earlier, its own finitude, its own confined time span. And that's something that Quinn is expressing very beautifully through this um, act of serial self-replication where you see his body aging in front of you. And particularly if you see the heads lined up next to one another, you get this incredible sense of, on the one hand, total stasis, literally frozen in time. And on the other hand, the sense of time's passage. And I would suggest to you that that same kind of quality of temporality as it's been absorbed into the sculpture is true of the reduction. So very different um, methodology, obviously, but I think to a very similar effect. And again, Quinn's work, unlike Warhol's and, and Hearst's, I would say is offering a kind of archaic or primordial resistance to the idea of being transformed into mere image, um, being spectacularized in that sense, uh, emphasizing the surface to the exclusion of substance. And I would say that um, Kondo's is the same because of his incredible depth of in investment in materiality. Um, another work that we can compare it to, if you go to the next slide, please, is this one by Jeannie and Antoni, which um, again, very well-known work of its period, 1993, called Lick and Lather. And what she did in this case was to, again, cast herself using two materials, chocolate on the left and soap on the right. In the case of the chocolate, she then literally consumed it, so licked it, uh, eight bits of it. Uh, and in the case of the soap bust, she took it into the bathtub with her and simply um, caressed it and um, rubbed water over it and allowed it to dissolve to some extent. So a, a different, um, again, a different type of reduction than you would see in the uh, ceramic self-portraits that Kondo is making, but again, to similar effect. And I think really emphasizing that quality of the act of art making as an act of disappearance or a passage of the physical self into a self that is within the realm of the imagination or the spirit. Another thing, of course, that we could say about Antoni's work is that it's very consciously feminist in orientation. So the idea of using chocolate, you know, a temptation that's often, often marketed to women, and soap, which is, of course, part of this regime of self-care that's also marketed to women. She's obviously responding to that. And that makes you think about Kondo's work, not just as about a body or about a self and a process of abstraction, but also as a male body and in connection to a whole histor history of male bodies, again, to do with Buddhism or meditative practice in general. And perhaps interesting to think about the possibility that Kondo's 
work is not just a statement about the condition of the body um, under 21st century conditions of mediation, but also specifically masculine body. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is in fact my last comparison, which is to Julian Stair. Um, thought it would be interesting to um, think about Stair, who's uh, an, again, a, a ceramic artist, very um, well-known uh, and prominent British ceramic artist, who's also thinking about this, um, this the reality of eventual death and the idea of ceramics relationship to the afterlife. Of course, the nigh universal uh, tradition all around the world of putting ashes or full bodies in these funerary urns. The large uh, urns that you see here are scaled such that you could put a whole body in, in them and then bury the person. This is a, a project that Stair made for the Sainsbury Institute up in Norwich, which of course has a, a wonderful uh, ceramic collection and a very strong Asian art collection. Um, and it was very much his response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, so just as we could see Kondo's work in relationship to the tsunami, as Joe was saying at the beginning, we could see Stair's work as in response to um, a different kind of disaster. But I think it's fascinating to see these pseudo anthropomorphic, especially the large scale urns in relationship to Kondo's work and a kind of conversation that suggests that both of these artists and indeed all the artists I think that I've shown uh, for you over the past few minutes are thinking about human expression, not just within the very confined parameters of a lifetime of the artist's lifetime of the viewer's lifetime, but are really thinking about it on a grander scale. You know, ceramics, of course, is the oldest of all artistic medium mediums, and these objects will long, long outlast all of us. Everyone who's on the Zoom call, you know, Kondo's work will be around hundreds, hopefully hundreds, thousands of years after we are. And it's really, I think, to that larger um, dimension of temporality that he's speaking. So if you go to the, my last slide, um, again, looking at his wave tea bowl, you know, I've dwelled on the figural uh, sculpture that he's made for the uh, purposes of this talk. But I think, you know, when we consider the effect visual and conceptual, and I think it is conceptual art that we're looking at here, even this T-ball is a, a kind of conceptual art, um, we can see that it's engaging with not only currents to do with 21st century and 20th century art, particularly pop art, as I was saying, um, and you know, uh, post uh, conceptual uh, process art based sculpture, but also we can think about it as engaging with a much larger palette of ideas and forces in which humanity is caught up. And somehow the swirling effect of this marbled clay in combination with the assertion of the surface that Kondo achieves with the Ginteki seems to me completely emblematic of that the turbulence of what it is to be a material thing in the world and simultaneously to be represented, to be raised to another echelon of awareness, of iconicity, of visuality, to be simultaneously physical or analog on the one hand and virtual on the other. And these are the extraordinary conditions in which we find ourselves and the ones that Kondo's work speaks to so powerfully. So thank you very much for um, listening to those uh, brief remarks. And now I have the incredible honor of um, passing the microphone over to the artist himself, Kondo Takihiro, and he will be accompanied by uh, translator Tomoko Ishii and uh, then in conversation with Joe Earl again. So uh, Kondo Sensei, the uh, platform is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Glenn. And thank you very much for joining us Today, I'm speaking Japanese from my studio in Kyoto. Slide no ho, onegai shimasu. Can you please change the slide? Eh, watashi no sakka no hajimari wa 1990 nendai kara desu. その時から現在までのキーワードとして相反するものを融合する、あるいは対極にあること、というイメージであり、それは今も私の重要な思考のきっかけとなっています。私のオリジナル技法銀的祭は1993年に土を媒介に火の中から水を表出させるというコンセプ
つまり火の対極として水をより強く意識したことで完成した技法です。I began my career as an artist in the 1990s. From then until now, I have been intrigued by the concept of combining two polar opposites or contradictory concepts. In 1993, I created Ginteki Sai, or Silver Mist, an original technique based on the concept of water born of fire. I was conscious of, of combining two opposing elements, fire and water, when devising this technique. Next, please. さて、私に最も衝撃を与えた出来事は、2011年 3.11 の東日本大震災の地震、津波と、原発の事故ですこの災害は人間が自然をコントロールすることができないということを再認識させられ私は改めて人間と自然との関係を問い直すこととなりますなぜならば陶芸はファイブエレメントに深く関わる仕事だからです The Great East Japan Earthquake and Tsunami of 2011 along with the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster Has had a strong influence on my work. As I began to explore the complex relationship between humans and nature, this disaster reconfirmed how we humans cannot control nature. This is important because my work is deeply connected with the five elements of earth, water, fire, wind, and the void. Next, please. ホタルと題したプロジェクトは、氷に見た,めて見立てたキューブ状のクラッシュガラスの中にウランガラスを封じ込め、ブラックライトを当てると、ホタルのようにウランが緑色に光るというもので、拡散した放射能を暗示したインスタレーションを行いました。もう一つが、命の器プロジェクトです。東北の山土を自ら掘り、上り釜で焼き上げた2000点近い器を、仮設,仮設住宅に入られた被災者の方々にお配りさせていただきましたえ。私は久しぶりに器を作ったことで、その後、器の造形概念を強く意識するようになっていきます。In 2011, I worked on two projects. The first project, Hotaru or Firefly, is where I created an installation using cubes of crushed glass. That look like ice and contain small amounts of uranium. Under black light, the uranium, like the radiation from the nuclear disaster, glows with a green light like fireflies. The second project was the Inochi no Utsuwa project, or Vessel of Life, where we gather local clay from the Tohoku region and created close to 2,000 small ceramic bowls, which we fired in the Noborigama, or climbing kiln. The bowls were gifted to victims of the earthquake. Who are living in temporary housing. Up until then, I had not used the wheel for quite a while. This project inspired me to revisit the concept of the Utsuwa or vessel. Next. So, in 2012, I was able to use the wave series, reduction of the Zazo series, and I was able to use the Zazo series, and I was able to use the Zazo series. From 2012, I started working on the wave series and the reduction series of seated figures, and eventually large white porcelain vessels, challenging myself to push the limits of what is possible to make using the wheel. Next, please. Wave は津波からインスパイアされて作り始めた作品で、黒、白、グレーの磁気土の練り込み技法と銀的によって、波や滝、流水、雫を表現してきた作品で、ある意味で私の銀的祭の集大成的な作品となりました。そして最新作として、ブルーホワイトによるクリアウォーターと題した作品を今回ニューヨークにて発表します。今の時代を浄化する象徴としてウェーブから発展させた作品です。My wave series is heavily influenced by the tsunami from the Tohoku earthquake in 2011. Here I combine black, white, and gray porcelain clay using neri komi and gintekisai to express different forms of water like waves and waterfalls, 
flowing water and water drops. I believe this could be considered the pinnacle of my Gintekisai works. My most recent work using blue and white clay is Clear Water, which is currently on exhibit in New York. This work takes the wave series a step further with water as a symbol for the purification needed given the current state of society. Next, please. Reduction wa 2012 nen kara 2017 nen made meisou shii suru zazou toshite seisaku shite kita sakuhin desu. 3.11 de naknatta hitobito eno chinkon, so shite jintai mo utsuwa de ali, jidai o utsu utsusemi toshite no utsuwa toshite 21 tai o seisaku shi, kore made kokunai gai de hapyo o shite kimashita. Reduction is a series of works made from 2012 to 2017, where I created seated figures that are meditating and in deep thought. In addition to reposing the souls of the victims of the Great East Japan earthquake, these figures represent the concept of the human body being a vessel, utsuwa, and are an embodiment of the current times, utsusemi. The 21 figures in this series have been exhibited internationally. Next, please. そして、自らがろくろで作ることのできる最大の大きさの器、白地大坪を現在も制作を,作り制作を続けています。大きいことで、作為と無作為、土と私の主体と客体が入れ替わる感覚、そして主客合一した大坪が立ち上がります。その後、主に上り窯で焼き上げる小生によって、偶然と必然とが交錯した器の造形が生まれます。Recently, I've been creating large scale white porcelain vessels that push the boundaries of scale. The large size determines the process, which involves a synthesis and inversion of the intentional and unintentional, as well as an interplay between the artist and clay, and changing roles between the subject and object. After the vessel is fired in the climbing kiln, a vessel created from chance factors and necessary conditions is born. Next. 私は空なる和と書いて器という造語を作りました。器セミから着想した器への思考はいわば魂が出たり入ったりする入り口出口でありよりしろであり現実と非現実が和合する空間でもあるのです。After exploring the concept of vessel, I created original, original kanji for utsuwa, with utsu meaning void and wa meaning combining. This word is inspired by the concept of utsusemi, the emptiness of a cicada's abandoned shell, also meaning one's mortal existence. In other words, the utsuwa or vessel allows the soul to enter and exit, much like an object representative of a divine spirit in a space where reality and unreality harmonize. Next. 私は昨年秋、京都市花瀬に登り釜を作りました。改めて陶芸の本質を探求するために。そして、作為と無作為、偶然と必然を内包する造形をさらに深めていきたいと思っています。Last fall, I created a climbing kiln in Kyoto City's Hanase area. This is where I hope to further explore the essence of ceramics by deepening my journey in exploring form that embodies the intentional and unintentional and chance and certainty. Andy Berkson に従って Homo Fabel という規定を受け入れるならば人間が生み出すことこそ人間の自然,自然ということになります。ただし、私は、登り釜という間接的作為を通して、作品を無作為の境地に送り出すことを試みるのです。それは、尿意キャラ、不尿意へ、そしてまた尿意へと連続していく器の造形、生命の躍動をまとう器、器でこそ成し得ることのできるアートの可能性があると考えています。The French philosopher Henri Bergson created a concept of homo faber to express the instinctive human need to create. But what I am doing is attempting to use the noborigama to indirectly bring out the unintentional and uncontrollable elements of the vessel that ultimately emerges from the kiln. Through this process, the vessel goes 
through a continuous process of controllable and uncontrollable, intentional and unintentional stages, and embodies the elan vital, the vital impulse. I think there is a possibility of there being art that can only be achieved through utsuwa based on its very nature as a vessel. Thank you for listening. And Thank you. we'd like to move on to the Q&A with um, Kondo Takahiro and Joe Earl. Well, thank you very much to all our speakers. I'm, I'm not sure how much time we have left. Um, I just very quickly like to say, since this, this whole webinar is created to some extent around the fact of the exhibition in Brooklyn, uh, let me encourage everyone to go there. Uh, Joan Cummins has done a wonderful job with that space, transforming it over the last two or three years. And it's wonderful the exhibition is there. And I hope you will, will all make it down to Brooklyn to see it. So um, I'm going to start off with, maybe we've only got time for one or at most two questions. The first one takes us back to table tennis. I think you're probably the only, the only really famous international practitioner of ceramic art who was also once a champion table tennis player. And uh, thinking that Kajikawa Yoshitomo coined this phrase, tenoshiso, which I've translated as the thinking hand, to characterize your work in general, and particularly your outsized white porcelains, I wonder if you could tell us something about the similarities that I know you've written about between the role of the thinking hand in championship table tennis on the one hand and ceramic art on the other hand. Hi. え、all sports, whatever they are, require shin gitai, which combines the athlete's heart with technique and physique. If these elements are not highly coordinated, one cannot compete at top level internationally. In a similar way, ceramics involves confronting the clay, where technique and physicality, as well as the spirit, becomes crucial in the creative process. Therefore, the lessons and training I received in the world of table tennis are applicable and valuable in my pursuit of ceramics. And so, uh, sorry, sorry, the sorry, thinking, go ahead. Uh, the, think, uh, the thinking hand, 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 the the idea of the thinking hand involves the hand concentrating the mind and honing the eye. There is a reciprocal relationship where the eye also refines the hand. Thank you. So just going on from that, one of our speakers, I forget which, mentioned uh, the idea-driven contemporary art world, the, the, the contemporary art world where the concept is more important than the execution. And you yourself have wondered recently in print, in the contemporary art world where the concept occupies such a central position, is a work's level of technical perfection such an important artistic criterion? I wonder how far this issue plays a part in your most recent work. Right. <laughs> が重要な要素であるという基本的な考え方だと思います。また一方現代美術は時代性とコンセプトが最も重要であると理解しています。そういう意味で今のジョーさんの質問は私にとってとても難しい質問ですだと思います。an important element is the idea that one should respect the material and should train one's skills to do so. On the other hand, contemporary art values having a concept and elements that reflect current society. Therefore, this question is quite challenging for me. Okay. Oh, sorry. 
えーとはい、私はイギリスから帰国後、陶芸と現代美術の狭間で、陶芸以外の実験的な作品も、えー、制作しています。例えば、石油の廃材を作ったオイルなど、そしてコンセプトをより強化して作品を作っていくには、ある意味で偶然が介在する陶芸では限界があるのではというふうに。えー、考えるようになっていましたこれはあのイギリスからの帰国ですけれどもそして2010年「死と再生」をテーマにリフ,リフレクションと題したセルフポートレートを制作し発表しこれで一旦実は陶芸から離れるっていうことを、えー、考えていましたちょうど50歳で私の陶芸を志すきっかけとなった小地豊が50歳でえー、自死しその同じ年ですねそういう意味で死,祖死と再生というテーマと重なった作品ですその後先ほども話したように2011年 3.11 が起こったことで私は自然と人間との関係を問い直すということで陶芸の本質を深めていくことが重要であると思い直したのです。After returning from the UK, I created some experimental pieces that can be placed between ceramics and contemporary art. One example is my work, Oil, which uses black material made from burning petroleum to ash. I began to think that ceramics, with its element of chance, might have its limits if I wanted to create works more focused on concept. This is after I returned to Japan. In 2010, I created a series of self portraits titled Reflection based on the concept of death and rebirth, with the intention of removing myself from the ceramic world, at least temporarily. This was, the,、uh, this was at the age of 50, the same age that my uncle Yutaka, who was a strong influence on me when I decided to pursue ceramics, took his own life. This was another connection to reflection linked to the concept of death and rebirth. Then, as mentioned earlier, the events of March 11, 2011 prompted me to re examine the relationship between nature and humanity. It made me reconsider and prioritize exploring the essence of ceramics. I know that 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 経験がなければ作品はできませんが、そのことだけに陥ることなく、作為から無作為の境地へ作品を送り出すこと、私,私の,あの大きな崩壊した白十大壺は、ある意味で私の技術の上に、さらに人間がコン,トロールコントロールできない領域を示していると思っています。Currently, my themes and concepts are centered on the intentional and unintentional, nature and humanity, and matter and spirit. Naturally, ceramics requires both technique and experience to create a piece, but I try not to fall solely into that realm. Instead, I strive to send my creations from the realm of intentional, intention to unintentional. The large collapsed white porcelain vase in, Brooklyn, in the Brooklyn Museum exhibition is a prime example. It reveals a realm beyond my technical skills and uncovers the area that is beyond human control. Thank you. Well, I think we're getting to the end of our time. So it just remains for me to thank, first of all, the artist himself for getting up so early in Kyoto and his wonderful interpreter,、uh, Ishii Tomoko, and also someone who hasn't appeared on the screen. Ruta Noreka, who's played such a big part in、uh, organizing Kondo Sensei's participation in this webinar.、Uh, I also offer thanks to Lark Mason and Richelle Cocol, who've、um, dealt with all the technical side of this on behalf of Asian Art Week, and of course, Margaret Tao. And、uh, the speakers, I think、I've, I hope I've thanked them already. And、uh, all of you for listening. If, anyone, if I've forgotten to thank anyone, please send, send me an email afterwards and I'll put it right. But I think that covers the whole field. Thank you all for listening and thank you all for staying up wherever you are in the world. Thank you especially to Glenn Adamson for talking to us at 2 a.m. from the Gulf. And good night. <laughs>